Hey, this is Michael Lindsay. Welcome to episode six of the Off Camber Podcast, presented by Specialized. And oddly enough, I'm actually in Specialized Building today because I'm here with Mike McAndrews, uh, more commonly known as Mick. Mike, uh, I, I, this one's fuck is like we chat before. I, before any of my prior media jobs, uh, I got to work in a suspension shop for a couple years for another, I would say, kind of legend of suspension, uh, Ross Maida. So yeah. I have a big inclination towards. So I really wanted to talk to you because you have a really cool crossover between the early days of factory moto, early days of that kind of development, and then eventually ending up here in the the cycling world. But for, like I said, I think a lot of people that know cycling have heard your name Mm -hmm. related to projects over the years between uh, RockShox, Specialized, Trek, all kinds of stuff like that. But uh, moto guys, uh, unless they've got maybe a little bit longer memory, they probably don't know what your original involvement was. Uh, How did you kind of get started? Well, like, you know, like a lot of guys, uh, I grew up racing amateur motocross, but I was in Northern California at that time. And, um, you know, Fox, the two Fox brothers were starting their businesses, um, which was very influential for a lot of the local motocross scene. And I was a good, you know, amateur motocross, but never had a shot at being professional at it. But I really loved the mechanical side of things and building bikes. Now, granted, this was back in the early 70s through the 70s. And there was a lot of technology evolving in motocross. If you look at what was coming out in 72 versus 78, big changes in how the bikes were laid out, how they were set up, amounts of travel, the sophistication of the shock and fork designs, all that stuff. So as a young racer uh, and a young tuner and as a young race engineer, all that's, we were front and center in helping drive that. So it was a great, great education. So for me, anyways, I, when I start, started building race bikes, I got a job with the Fox Back in the 70s, Fox had a motocross team for privateers. And some of the guys that raced there were Donnie Cantalupe, uh, Danny Turner, Mark Barnett got his start there. Steve Wise actually rode for him. You gotta go back in your history book, but these were factory yeah. guys. I was actually at Fox's uh, Motos building the other day and there was a Steve Wise replica bike there. A couple yes. of the earlier, there's like three or four good of the early yes. Fox bikes there. Yes, yes. And uh, so that was, that was my launching pad. And I worked for a young guy named Larry Wasick. He was only 16 or 17 at the time. He did one year with, with the Fox team and then got picked up by Kawasaki. And I followed him down to Southern California as, as his mechanic and then stayed there for 10 seasons. And uh, what was fun is in those days, you know, because I had a, being part of the Fox team, we were, uh, Bob Fox was developing air shocks and forks at the time. So as, as one of the, the race mechanics, you had to know your way around shock absorbers because we were helping in the development of them in the off season, but we were also tuning them as we were on the road. And then also he had factory guys using them and we had to be able to repair them and do that type of stuff. So it gave me a good into the early uh, suspension technologies so then we went to Kawasaki, and in those days, we relied heavily on Kayaba for uh, suspension support. Again, the technology was moving really quick, and a lot of cases in those days, Showa was maybe moving a little quicker than Kayaba was. And um, so we were, found ourselves at a disadvantage uh, with what Honda was doing, and even probably some of the support that Yamaha was getting out of Kayaba. So in those days, Roy Turner, myself, um, I'm trying to think some of the early guys, was primarily Roy, um, who had a good understanding of shock absorbers. We just started doing the development in-house, and we were kind of the first to do that because everybody else was getting better support than we were. Um, And uh, so, again, being front and center as as it evolved. And a lot of the stuff we were doing ourselves, and we we kept it within the team. And in those days, um, you know, when you worked with Kayaba, our fear was, um, if we if we were improving the designs, and they would just end up over at Yamaha and Suzuki uh, later in the week. So we started that program, and it, it really was beneficial because we were actually able to move the technology and get the performance where we wanted it a lot quicker. And so I've been involved in it. It's kind of funny because that's definitely a, a foray to like how that team structure even is mm-hmm. now. Kawasaki. Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki, all of them, whether it's OEM testing or even race team, well, yes, they have a contract with KYB or Showa. Um, pretty much every one of those teams has an internal suspension guy who yep. deals with a representative from the company, but same thing, they take, you know, they get equipment, they get ideas from them, but they definitely keep some of that development internal and keep that information, per se, that yep. the ability to try to keep that information uh, internal. So it's kind of cool, even the time you were at Cowie, between stuff like that, um, the early days of truck, I mean, Cowie teams definitely kind of been a forerunner for certain yeah. situations in, in race teams. Yeah. Um, 
so that's kind of cool. You come over there, like I said, any any mechanic at that time kind of had to be box van driver, suspension <laughs> guy, um, therapist possibly. Oh yeah, financial advisor. <laughs> we did it all, and uh, and we had to do motor work, and uh, yeah, so there was. Uh, we had to know, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, frame modifications and things we were doing. Um, in, in Kawasaki, especially, they they were underfunded at the time uh, compared to the other other teams, just because their their off road sales weren't that strong, and it was reflected in the amount of budget that uh, Kawasaki put forth on the motocross team. But for me, um, sometimes it was challenging in the early years. But as far as challenging us as um, you know, engineers, suspension guys, and all that stuff, we had free reign of it. We didn't have a big engineering group from Japan telling us what we could and couldn't do. They were just saying, could you guys go win some races? You know, that, that was kind of the, the mindset with Kawasaki. So for us, it was great. We were able to just do whatever we wanted as long as the bikes were finishing, as long as we were competitive, um, because they just didn't have the support to offer. So a lot of good guys. I mean, Rick Ash. I mean, I used. I mean, Rick just retired a few years ago, but Rick was part of the early crew. Tom Morgan, who I think still does engine work on his own, was part of that early group. Uh, Norm Bigelow kind of kept us all um, orchestrated and going the right way. Um, you know, Roy Turner, who's a brilliant guy in his own right, just really smart. Um, a lot of people know him as a great team manager, but he's he's just got a really good feel for the motorcycle. Uh, you know, suspension, motor, all that stuff. Uh, Tom Halverson was with us for a while too. Tom's, uh, you know, head of Yamaha Road Racing, but he was on the team for a while as well. But uh, really that core group was there for the whole duration that I was there and, and contributed a lot. But to your point, when I look at the teams now and how they're structured, we had to do it just to survive, right? Yeah. Um, but now you see that, uh, you know, you had the good guys doing the mo that were good at motors, they're doing all the motor work. The suspension guys are doing it all. And now they have separate teams and they're able to continue it. But we started doing that as well because later in my career there, Roy moved on to be team manager and then I stayed in um, house. I didn't want to travel anymore because I had some kids that were starting to get into school. But I ran the um, testing program uh, full time, which we had never done that. In the old days, you did the testing program at least for most of the factory teams on the road with your rider. So he'd fly in a day or two early and then you'd go suspension testing or motor testing or whatever it was you needed to do. So I was able to do that um, full time at, towards the end of my career where we were doing all the suspension work plus all the motor work um, continuously and doing it at home. So Wardy would come down, we'd do all our testing and then he would fly back. And uh, at that time, Morgan was working on his bikes on the road. So a lot of that stuff you see is now kind of standard operating procedure for the teams. So me and you were talking before we started this, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of about some of the riders you had wrenched for and kind of a funny one that came up as a uh, little bit of flash forward to the future to being even in the, in the mountain bike or just the pedaling world period is somebody that uh, was down a similar path. You were telling me a story about when you were working for Jeff Ward, um, he's racing championship against Omara, yep. whose mechanic was a, uh, Felt at the time, who yeah. ended up starting on a felt bicycle. So it's kind of funny. There's quite a few guys yeah. from Moto that have carried over into this industry um, over the years. Yeah, and I think you know the uh, you know the founder of Rock Shocks. A lot of people may or may not know is a, a guy named Paul Turner. And Paul and I lived in the little town over here called La Selva Beach, in the Santa Cruz area. Grew, grew up racing motocross. His brother Jim Turner was Canadian national champion. So the, they were really entrenched in motocross as I was. And Paul was actually a factory Honda mechanic at the same time I went down to Kawasaki, which is odd, um, that we both found ourselves down there uh, working for uh, competitors when we only lived a block apart up here in Northern California. But it was Paul who founded Rock Shocks. I mean, he, um, he, you know, I think a lot of us that were drawn into the sport in the 70s, I'm sure Jim was the same way, Jim felt, Paul Turner, there was Steve Simons, who was also one of the principals of Rock Shocks. The early days of mountain bike, reminded me personally a lot of the early days of motocross where the you know the tech there was a lot of garage garage shop technology is what they used to refer to it because the racers could actually get into the to the designs and change things quicker than the factories could and so you just saw all these crazy contraptions and and everybody trying to solve for the same thing but coming at it in different ways and so i think for a lot of us that grew up in the motocross you know uh world and saw that 
uh, take place. Um, and then it was, you know, the technology was, uh, the pace was starting to level out a little bit on the motocross side. All of a sudden you see this whole new sport, all this, uh, you know, early d technology and how quick the development was going. And it was, it was a natural to kind of jump over and, and participate. For me, um, and, you know, Turner, uh, and Jim, Jim was always kind of on the frame side, but because I had so much experience on the suspension side, it was it was easy to kind of come in there and help, uh, you know, contribute and and kind of drive some of those early designs because some of those things were kind of crazy, and uh, we were able to maybe hopefully get them on the right path. The uh, some kind of cracks that we were talking about just like basically in that time you guys could modify and you had a little more more say outside the factory. So even when you were with Cowie, what was uh, off the top of your head, is there two rider situations that come up, something that was super unique you guys have done to bikes or somebody like, because you hear it now, I'll, I'll go up and ask me, it's like, oh, what's different between, you know, two factory teams, same guy like, oh, he's on, you know, different suspension saying maybe a little bit different linkage curve and some different mapping. And they consider that, you know, in different yeah. pegs up. But in those days, you guys could actually have uh, people on basically different frames. And <laughs> yeah, there, there was a... There was a while there because I am really going to date myself here, but we were we were in the that transition from air uh, air cooled motors to water cooled motors, and um, and so Japan had sent us some bikes. They had sent us some air cooled 250s for Supercross because their thinking was okay, it doesn't get hot enough. And, the, and these were really kind of some really bitching bikes, like a 190 pound 254 speed transmission, just the spindly little, almost looked like a trials motorcycle. Um, and then the outdoor was this big, all bulky, water-cooled radiators up high, and so what was we that the one with the goofy yeah. scoop on the front number plate and everything? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that one too. Um, so we we had bikes that were just like so different, and so what happened in our early s testing? It was like the guys, wow, we really love the attribute of this this one, and we love the attribute of this one, but you know this one doesn't do all the things we needed to. And so again, this was the style back in Kawasaki, we were free to do whatever. And so we were taking this frame and uh, you know, dropping radiators down and moving some of these parts over. And some guys liked the longer frames, some guys liked the shorter frames. And uh, so we were making some real hybrids. Cause if you think about it back then we had Goat Brecker who was quite tall and uh, Jeff Ward who was quite short. So uh, we were just moving things all around. In those days, but you know, it's funny, a few years later, when you looked at the bike Brecker would have rode and the Je uh, bike that Jeff would have rode, I think they were even using the same seats. Um, but so a lot of that stuff where, you know, some guys would run still air cooled outside and, and because they didn't like that weight up high and then guys would have air cooled or water cooled, excuse me. And, uh, and we had radiators in all different positions. I mean, if you were the mechanic and you wanted the radiators down low and you could figure out how to do it, you did it. So, uh, Two other things come up more on suspension design. The, the first one is moving into to Supercross. The earliest days of Supercross were just some freaking ski jumps here and there. But as, as it started to develop and actually get some rhythm lanes, um, just the abrupt, especially, you know, it's funny. Listen, some guys complain about super cross track. Now I still just want to hand them a video of stuff, especially from the eighties about how, <laughs> how poorly built a lot of that was, yes. um, suspension or going into those days, what was the first like mod of get, or then pretty much what'd you guys have to go with at first, just stiffer springs and a lot thicker weight oils. Yeah. And then what were some of the first major modifications that were directed directly to again, the bikes or super cross? Well, you, you bring up a good point because it, there was a bit of a moving target because the the sport of Supercross was still developing on and how they laid out the courses. And if you go back in history, some of those courses, they, they were still, it was almost, you know, uh, we were talking about Enduro Cross earlier uh, today, but we, we would end up at some stadium and there would be like log obstacles and there would be water holes and you're like, what the hell is this? They, they were still trying to figure out what would what work, Supercross what was. the Supercross would be and what would draw the fans in. And, and uh, so for us, I mean, obviously outdoor motocross was well established. That's what the bikes were designed for. And then as we went indoors, we were trying to figure out what to change on the bike, uh, you know, to make it better for that stuff. So obviously some of the, some of the easier ones were uh, a little bit shorter wheelbases. We were playing around with triple clamps to, to make them steer a little quicker, that type of stuff. But the suspension, it's funny, the actual, the, the suspension movement for a long time, uh, you know, we weren't really picking up on that, but it wasn't until the Supercross tracks really started to develop and be defined and had some similarity 
uh, around the whole circuit that, you know, doubles and rhythm sections and all these things started to become established. And you started realizing that it wasn't about the comfort, meaning absorbing this stuff for forward momentum, but it was that, um, that ability to almost remove that vagueness of gobbling up bumps to give these guys something that was firm enough as a platform to, to be able to, to catch the air. Because in the early days, I mean, you look at a face of a jump, these things, these bikes would come around and boof, they would just lose so much There's energy. Momentum, yeah, and then that thing would just like this. And I, I'm still amazed when I watch these guys come out of a turn, brop, and then they just launch, you know, over three or four jumps, right? Um, and all that has to do with the firmness. It doesn't all have to do with it. I mean, the motors and everything else is devo- uh, developed. But you, you ask about the suspension setting. Stuff that's so stiff that uh, uh, we never would have thought we were there. Just just going stiffer, stiffer, stiffer on springs, damping all, all of the above. Sometimes to the detriment, because I'll see some of these guys, when I'm watching these days, I mean, just through the rhythm setting, it's perfect, but it's unforgiving, man. Once that thing goes, they're down. Yeah. Well, it's funny. One of my first experiences getting to go to a Supercross testing uh, with Ross, I, it was so much fun for me to, especially the test tracks in Corona, everybody rides the same freaking two inch line every lap. So for the sake of being able to replicate is really mm-hmm. cool. Being able to go out, make a little clicker change on a fork, a little softer, a little stiffer, mm-hmm. some different rebound, and actually not only just wait for their opinion, but actually being able to visually see it because yeah. it is such a difference on as abrupt as those jump face are the way the rhythms is you can see the difference in how the bike is reacting on the jump face just because they're able to replicate that same line every lap so yeah. i think a lot of people realize like the amount of forces applied like it's cool to be able to watch it like that um and i also remember another one that ross told me about the stiffness is uh he i asked him kind of one time similar question like well yeah, what was the first real super cross thing you built and i can't remember which year it was but he did joke with me about he goes, I, I made something that was so ridiculously stiff, I thought there was no way yeah. it theoretically should work. And it, he goes, no, testing it because what Supercross yeah. tracks were doing, he goes, yeah. it was amazing where it helped. Mm-hmm. Like, it was so much stiffer than what he said he thought even a year or two prior yeah. to that they would ever reach. Yeah, I totally agree with it. Because even at, when I left the sport um, and was doing the bicycle stuff. Ricky Zielfelder, the owner of Factory Connections, a good friend of mine. So that that's kind of my link in. And it was within like two or three years. He was going, Mick, you would not believe the spring race that we're running on these things, right? So there was there was a there was a a point there, and it was probably driven by what Ross was doing there because all of a sudden it was just crazy jump and stiffness, and all of a sudden the way these guys could hit these things and just launch these things. Um, repeatedly uh, was noticeable. Yeah, yeah. Like, what was a uh, for Kawasaki when you guys early day or Supercross? What was typical fork spring, shock springs? Like three eights, four O's, <laughs> front front fork springs. You know, a five O, five two, five four was stiff on the back of a Kawasaki. I was about to say, I think the uh, production KX four fifty comes with like a five O in the front. The Honda comes with five O in the front. <laughs> Suzuki's we, five, or five point five O, and the, the rears are like five fours, five fives. I, I couldn't have put a five O in the forks because they didn't have them. Right? It was like <laughs> we weren't even thinking that way. Oh, now we got now we got big guys here car around six O. Jeez. <laughs> The yeah uh, so that um, the other one because uh, what what year did you leave Kawasaki? Well, so what I did um, I was going to start my own suspension company, Factory Connection, which I did towards the again it was all about family. I mean I loved Kawasaki it was a great great team and we had great guys there, but I had a young family and my kids were starting school. Uh, I used to my wife was from New England, so we spent a lot of time there over the years when the circuit was back there. So for me, I had come up with a way to kind of transition out of all the travel, stay in a field that I knew. So I'd started uh, the suspension business, Factory Connection, out of my garage. I mean, it was just, I had an old Kawasaki box van. I I always kid about a box of shims and uh, some spare parts, and I started it, right? So, but for me, I had already built my house in New England, up in Vermont, and, you know, had got everything going and was leaving Kawasaki, um, and Wardy was still winning. I mean, this uh, you could see that guy was going to, and he's still winning, right? So he was going to outpace me. Um, but Hannah, Bob Hannah had called me, and, and Bob and I um, had never worked together. We were always on the opposite side of the fences, but, I mean, he was, uh, you know, he's a legend, right? So he was doing his last year, which was 1989. Suzuki. Suzuki. And the mechanic he had, they were going to give him to 
one of the new up and coming riders, maybe Buddy Antonez or one of the young guys coming up at the time, could have been Tishner. You have to go check your history. So, you know, Bob just wanted to do nine races and retire. It was his farewell deal, but he was very serious. He didn't want to go out there and be mid pack. He wanted no, to go out there and win Bob is. Yep. nine races. So he called me and he said, Hey, I hear you're retiring. I need a mechanic that's experienced because I, I'm, I'm retiring. I want to do nine races. Would you do it? And he goes, I know Suzuki maybe doesn't pay what Cowie does, but I'll, I'll do what I can do. I told him, I said, man, it would be an honor. And it was. Um, and I just said, go in and get as much money as you can. And I said, whatever it is, I'll do it. And so we became good buddies. Uh, it was a pleasure to help him through his last year. I never worked so hard because <laughs> he was and and he was competitive at every race. Uh, you know, but it was odd races. You know, English Town was an important race to him. So we went and did that and he won it. Right. The Florida series. He loved the Florida series. Because back in the 70s, that's that's all there was. I mean, it was a huge event. And that's where he kind of made a name in that rough sand. We went down there and he won that, battling a young Mike LaRocco. Was was that the year that he did? I, I'm totally off on Possima years. Or was that the year he did Dilla Destinations? He oh, didn't. No, nah, it was maybe two years before two years that. Before yeah. That. So his last race was at Unadilla. Um, and it was a Grand Prix. It was a 250 Grand Prix. Um, but he, it was, a, it was a big event, man. They had flown in everybody, uh, and it just, it, it was enough. It was hard to even just keep our, our, our minds focused on racing. But he ended up, I think, seventh overall. He, he was, he was fast. He was competitive. But I think, just all of the, the hoopla just got to him, and he, he wasn't as edgy as he normally was. But so that was so. Eighty nine was probably the last year uh, professionally that I was uh, working as a race mechanic, and it happened to be for Bob. Uh, and again, it was just because he had asked, and then when somebody like Bob Hanna asks, that's an honor, yeah, and I took it. Yeah, for right. sure. So the the factory connection thing's funny because yeah. I, I mean we see it now. It's basically it's the Geico deal. Honda team. Yes. Uh, it's, yes. it's factory connection rate FCR technically, and then you have factory connection the the public suspension side. A lot of people. Uh, I know who Ziggy is because of that, but how the heck did he get involved if you started your, like, where, where's that all where, from? Ziggy? So yeah. Ziggy was a young race mechanic for a guy named uh, Gene Numack, who was a Team Green privateer. Uh, so he's sponsored by Team Green. He was an up-and-comer, and his dad had put together a really good race program for Gene. And that's where we met Ziggy. He was Gene's mechanic, and he was from New England as well. So when I started my business back there, Ziggy had his own business. He was working at a Yamaha shop, but on the weekends he was doing race prep. He was building race bikes. And so we kind of partnered where he was helping me uh, do factory connection stuff. So what he would do in the early days, he would be at a race and guys would uh, load up uh, shocks and forks. And I might be at another race up in District 3 or something. And he would take the internals out and then send them up to me. I would modify the internals, send them back, and then he would do the assemblies, and, as well as you know, prepping race bikes and stuff. And so we were always good friends, always worked closely together. And he was getting smarter and smarter about the suspension stuff. But again, the factory connection that I started was in my garage that then ended up in a barn, and then we ended up in a proper shop. So it wasn't what as big as it was. And so when Paul Turner called and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in coming and helping running the R&D department of, of uh, Rock Shocks is starting to grow, that, that um, was of interest to me because uh, of my engineering background and how I wanted to grow. I really wanted to develop product and I enjoyed kind of what I was doing with Factory Connection. But I was able to talk Ricky into to buying, you know, the company, which basically we took it out of my barn and put it down in his barn. But Ricky, you know, to his credit, was a really good businessman. And uh, so he kept the factory connection going. And then I was affiliated as need be. I mean, I was always there if he ever needed anything. In the early days he did, but within he was a quick study within a few months. I mean, I would hear from him maybe once a month on technical issues and things like that. But the smart thing that he did I used Factory Connection to get out of professional racing, to spend time with my family. He used it to get, he into, used it. It to get into it. So we were two different. It, had I kept it, it would have probably just be some local guy up in Vermont doing shocks. Uh, but he, you know, went out and got some of the early sponsors. And I, I you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I got it completely right, but I think I know Jack in the Box was one of his first big sponsors. Doc Martin was in there as well. 
So he started getting some big money and putting together a really good uh, privateer team at the time. But, you know, Honda joined in. He got Mike LaRocco kind of, you know, where I think Suzuki was thinking maybe LaRocco was done. I'm not sure what the deal was at that time. But to get LaRocco in there as his first rider, and then Mike kind of has a second win and starts being really competitive. So in a lot of ways, his race team was a lot bigger than what the actual business was, and then the business kind of filled the vacuum behind it. Have you been to their uh, to their newest race shop in Corona? I haven't. You got to go check it out. That's actually so the episode I did before this with uh, their engine guy Christian Kibby. Their their race shop puts every other factory team's race shop to shame. I got to go see <laughs> it then. Next time we're down there. But uh, I guess the last question I was going to ask you before we finally move into the cycling world is uh, a moto related question about development is. Um, because in cycling, like I didn't realize it until I started paying attention to mountain biking the last couple of years is how big of a deal linkage systems are. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's got their own design, their own pitch, their own theory behind it. Uh, Moto, for anybody that's gonna do a linkage curve test in the last couple of years, other than the KTM and Husky, everybody, <laughs> all drivers are very close to the same. Their, their curves are minuscule yeah. difference. Right. But that wasn't the case in your guys' day. That was also a big deal. Everybody had their marketing term for their different systems and their mm-hmm. different linkages. Um, how much did getting to see all that happen help going into mountain biking and uh, stuff like again, that? Again, I mean, that was one of the technologies that we were front and center on because, you know, we went from as young racers, twin shock bikes, uh, to seeing the single shock bikes, seeing the leveraged rear shock absorbers. Because some of the early Yamahas, they had single shocks, but they weren't leveraged, right? So you didn't really get any of the advantage. And so what we, you know, seeing all the different ways you could use the linkage to your advantage um, and disadvantage as some of the early designs were, allowed uh you know the the bikes um to kind of for sure to evolve especially in the longer travel because it was it's key to helping manage the travel but then also um you know how you uh, the shock absorber itself um the packaging and everything was just a lot better but what happened you know because um coil spring technology is what you know the motocross stuff is all uh, based around and and we do know obviously there's some air forks out there and and if you go back when I was at Fox we actually had air rear shocks is, is what um, you know Fox's claim to uh, fame claim to fame was in the early days uh, these air shocks these twin air shocks but air um, so anyways what happened was I think you're right the, everybody kind of got to that same point where they've got the back end behaving like they want to based on a coil shock and the leverage ratios as far as piston speeds, right? Because one of the things that you can do if the piston speed in the shock is too quick, it, it's very difficult. It's easy to overproduce on big spikes and hits and stuff like that. If, it, if it's too slow, then you can't get the range of damping you want over the uh, trail events, all the different tra- uh, track events, trail events that you're seeing. So you end up in that range of like 2.7, 3.1 or 3.0 to one and uh, for you know wheel to shock travel and you get good piston speed right so you can you can use your low speed mid speed high speed um, get a couple uh, circuits working on the rebound Um, some of the early designs when they're highly leveraged there's just not enough piston speed so you can't do a lot there and then when they're under leveraged the piston speed's so hot the shock gets so hot uh, that sometimes it's it's really easy to overproduce. So a lot of where we ended up with on the motocross stuff was out of damping, to be honest, control, but then also the curve is right to to work with the the coil. We played around a little bit. We had flatter curves, progressive curves, but uh, I'm not a huge fan of progressive um, on the heavier bikes just because it seems like you give travel away and then you can't use the end of it. So you kind of narrow the actual bump zone. Um, but on the mountain bikes, it, the reason we, we obsess over it is because it's human powered, right? So we're dealing with, you know, Trying coming to up with that systems. power loss, right? Exactly. Yeah. On the motocross bikes, you know, the inefficiencies of the system have made it efficient. And what I mean by that, the early days of Horst Leitner and his four bar linkage system, he was developing that for, for motorcycles. And what he was able to do is he put it on a cowie, and I remember testing it where it actually took the, the engine torque out of the rear suspension so that it was just completely neutral. The power of the, uh, 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 the torque of the motor had no effect on the suspension, so it was just free. And you'd go through bumps and it was like blah, 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 and the thing was, oh my God, it gobbles it up. But the guys, they'd, they'd hit a jump and, and they, 
and they're like, we can't jump. Yep. And and it's basically, I mean, you're a writer, you know, you guys, you just grow up knowing that if you, you, you know how to suck the back end and, and release it, right? It's just, uh, you know, that you're just pulling it in and then you're chopping it. And that's you, uh, probably a lot of writers don't even realize what they're doing. I was but, say it's something that I think most of us don't realize we're naturally yeah, doing in the moment. Yeah, because it's, you know, that chain, the chain line, if you look at the counter shaft to the, to the rear sprocket, there's a distance there. And as it gets shorter, the chain gets shorter and you're, the torque of the motor is trying to pull it in. And uh, and so in the early days, we thought that was a disadvantage. And it probably was in like 1960 European motocross, right, where all they absorbed was bumps. But the young generation of riders, the Jeff Wards and, and uh, you know, the Hannas and these guys that were actually starting to use, figuring out how to upshift and, and use the torque to hold the back end down. Once you lost that thing, um, you know, they couldn't get the thing off the jump. But for us in the bicycle space, it's all about the pedal efficiency as well, because, uh, you know, downhill bike, not so much, but when you get into, you know, the enduro and cross country trail segments and cross country race segments, full suspension, we need that to absorb the bumps, decouple the rider's mass from the terrain, keep that forward momentum going, but we need to be able to have a system that you can pedal and uh, a high percentage of the energy is going to driving it. And you can lose a lot of it if the system isn't right. So our linkage systems, uh, a lot of it are, are designed off that, but then also we embraced air spring technology early because of its weight and have worked on linkage curves that help us get something as close to a coil spring as we can out of the back so that it's, you know, it, it rides well in the stroke and then has a nice linear movement through. Cool thing is if you get it right, then you get that nice hook that an air spring gives us. And- uh, Bottoming resistance. Yeah. So, well, um, funny one I was thinking earlier when you were just talking about piston speed um, and travel speed. I, I didn't realize this till I visited. Um, I, I never thought of it in this manner because um, I kind of knew what the the meter per second travel of dirt bike suspension was, but I didn't realize how high that actually was compared to other form of motorsports or other yeah. suspended objects until I went to Old Leans for the first time and I went through their race area where they literally had Formula One suspension, World Rally Car, mm-hmm. Moto and road race stuff and of course i'm thinking in my mind oh the stuff on the moto gp bikes must be pretty mm-hmm. trick and then i saw it apart and it wasn't mm-hmm. anything i didn't expect like anything i hadn't really not seen See, before yeah. and then one of the guys started explaining to me the uh you know the travel the travel speed of the suspension i didn't realize that moto was was that high you know mm-hmm. f1 road racing was i think they said something like three four meters per second mm-hmm. average and moto stuff they're measuring at eight ten mm-hmm. uh the one that was kind of cool to see though was the rally car looked like a giant moto shock because the yes. rally cars actually yes. see some pretty yeah, pretty smack. high travel speed <laughs> yeah they they smack some good stuff what's uh what uh what's crossover like that for mountain biking is uh well, well you know mountain biking it's not as uh it's probably closer to early motocross um but we see you know uh wheel speeds i'll go off the wheel speeds uh because it is one to one on the fork on the fork six to seven meters per second is what we can we can pick up and we'll get similar out of the back um and again it's uh you know primarily in the downhill stuff but the enduro stuff as well yeah when we do data acquisition so th- the travel is getting there to where we can actually you know accelerate these things quick enough to get into some of those shaft speeds in the early days, I can remember doing some data acquisition uh, in Japan in the Kawasaki days, and the fastest we could get those forks uh, at that particular test session was about six and a half to seven meters per second. But I think they go faster now. <laughs> they go a little faster now. And back then it was the slap down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it still is. It's got to be. Yeah. That's yeah. A, yeah. Hey, just taking a quick break from our conversation with Mike McAndrews to thank the three brands that make this podcast happen. First and foremost, I'm talking to Mick at his place of work, which is specializes HQ in Morgan Hill, specializes the presenter of the off camera podcast. If you haven't checked them out, they've got a huge range of course of bicycles being one of the leaders, if not the leader in that market, every type of mountain bike you can think of every type of road bike, city commuters, e-bikes, everything in between, check them out, specialized.com. 
Also got Fox Racing on board. As I said before, new V3 helmet. Got to personally go out and try it. It's a really big improvement over the prior helmet, mostly in the fit and function of the helmet. Um, you're a lot more inside the helmet now instead of popping out. It has a lot more protection around the forehead area, um, around the cheeks. You just feel like you're more secured in the helmet. Honestly, it has more of a feel of like a high end, say a Shoei on a Rai, where you just have more of that entry comfort when you slide in the helmet plus all the technologies that they've added into it for safety check it out at foxracing.com we also have shoprell motorsports they've been around for more than 30 years quads dirt bikes side by sides parts accessory gear check them out at shopmoto.com throw in the code ml512 to save yourself a few dollars at checkout when you first went to rock shock um a what year was it and b what did what did it look like? What were you working on, to yeah. put it bluntly? Yeah. <laughs> you know, size of components, yeah, uh, yeah. travel length, et cetera. No, it was pretty funny um, because I, you did that step out of motocross right into the mountain bike scene. And this would have been 92-ish, 1992, 1993, towards the end of 93, beginning, or uh, end of 92, kind of beginning of 93. So what was funny is uh, the travel, uh, because it was really mountain bikes at that time, for, front forks were just starting to be suspension forks were just starting to be accepted uh, you know prior to that because i would go to mountain bike events on the east coast and see my old friend paul turner and see kind of the struggles he was up against but you had all these guys racing mountain bikes with rigid forks and um, it was kind of a road bike mentality oh i'm not going to put that on there that's a pound heavier than what i got so it took he had a little bit of an uphill battle in the beginning if you came from a motocross background boom you were putting those things on and you were understanding the the benefits but a lot of the guys were coming into the sport from road cycling and didn't didn't understand just it jarring themselves to death yeah so paul had some very simple dampers in there that were almost like locked out almost like a you know like a blow-off valve really it just held itself in the stroke and then you hit something and boof it, it would move without a very little compression damping, if any, and then it was just rebound to return it. So they were very simple, but they only had like 35 millimeters of travel. 35 millimeters of travel is what they had. And I remember our first downhill fork, uh, proper downhill fork was a whopping 80 millimeters of travel. So that's, that's three, across three and a quarter inches. That's, yeah. a, very, that's a short, <laughs> short travel cross, cross country, country yes. bike these days. Um, so when I got there, we were transitioning, Rockshox was transitioning from their first design, which was called an RS1 to, um, or excuse me, RS1 and the MAG-20 had the same internals. We were transitioning over to what was called a MAG-21. And that had some air shocks, you know, they were still using air springs, but we were putting in a negative spring uh, to kind of take the nose off that locked out feeling. Um, because the first ones just had pure air, so you had a, um, you know, the slope uh, or the excuse me, the uh, the knee was quite steep. You know, it was just like boof on the spring curve. So we put a negative spring in there to kind of take the the edge off the first part of the spring. Uh, you know, relax kind of that that hard point where it starts moving. Um, travel was up to maybe 40 millimeters, 38, 40 millimeters. We were going long travel. And then, but this dampering system was still pretty simple. Um, so we, we kind of got that into production. Then we started on what was called the Judy, which actually had a through shaft damper and had proper piston design, proper valving and all that stuff. And we were moving away from air spring. Uh, we tried, you know, coil spring versions of it. We tried elastomers um, and then ultimately ended up with some better air spring designs and coming back to it. So. But at the same time, I mean, one of the first projects I had was to develop a rear shock. And at that time, the linkages, we were talking about linkages earlier, a lot of the linkage systems um, were still being ironed out. So I did this really cool shock. We never went to production with it, though, but I always liked it. It had a position-sensitive feature inside it. And, you know, years later, I think WP came out with a, a, a rear shock So uh, that was, was similar. Um, but basically, I, I was just thinking of how could I, you know, change this shock absorber to be position sensitive, because that's what was needed. I needed a lot of damping at the top part to to pedal against, and then I needed to move off it and then have a proper damping curve as you got a little deeper into it. And so it it was a shock design that you would probably recognize, but it had just a almost like a uh, a needle, uh, like out of a carburetor based in the bottom. And I had some weird shapes on it so that I could go from a zero bleed to a proper bleed to, but also had shims on it. 
And um, so we had different features and things that we would do there. We were using a coil on it at that time, but I also worked on an air version of it. But the funny thing was at that time, there wasn't a lot of full suspension bikes. We were anticipating it and we were working with some of the guys that were working on it, but there just wasn't a market. So we ended up putting that on the back burner and focusing on some of the new fork models. Cause we were a small group. There was only about 11 of us that ran marketing and advanced R and D for those guys in the early days. Um, at that point, like what were some of the bike brands you guys were working with? How much were you guys doing? Were you guys more aftermarket at point or were you guys having any OEM contracts? Right in that transition, because you're exactly right. It was it, what started the company originally was Paul selling aftermarket, but companies like Specialized, uh, Mike Sinyard, who's always kind of got that keen eye to the to the future, he saw the advantages and so partnered up early with RockShox. Um, Trek, not so much in the beginning, but GT bicycles, they were a powerhouse in those days. Um, and GT was probably uh, the biggest supporter and probably the closest OE customer. So in, by the time I got there, the OE customers, Specialized uh, GT were going big and some of the smaller brands at the time, Diamondback, um, there were some obscure brands back then too. Uh, Fisher was still owned by Gary Fisher, Fisher. but Gary was still, uh, he was somebody who liked the new technology. Uh, Trek. Uh, probably within a year or two, uh, was specking the stuff. So it, it quickly went from a small aftermarket company to a large OEM business. And that's probably what, it didn't kill it, but damn near killed that company a few times because it was doubling and tripling in size annually so because of the OEM volumes. And the sport was growing, the application to OEM was growing, and, um, and this company was trying to grow and keep up with it as far as the manufacturing side of it. Well, with that many bike brands coming in and out, going from forks to shocks to different linkages to different lengths of travel, did time go by really fast per se? <laughs> yes, like a blink. But you know what's funny? Because I, you know, we were talking about, I came out of motocross where we basically had 12, 13 inches of wheel travel. We had, you know, hundred millimeters of stroke travel in the shock. And, and I'm used to all these multi circuits and blending them and tuning them and, and flow patterns and stuff. And then I get into the space where there's like 30 millimeters of travel. There's no, I mean, it was pretty crude stuff. It wouldn't be quite a few years later to where I could actually pull from all that knowledge and really start you know, driving some good designs, to be honest, once the travel and piston speeds and got, got going. Well, what was the biggest, you know, hang up being able to carry over the information for Samoa? Is it purely carrying over most stuff would have made the bikes basically too heavy? Was it cost of the component, uh, like to do that to mountain bikes? No, I think it was just um, the, the application still on the, you know, from the consumer's standpoint, they didn't want a lot of travel. I mean, when you're talking 35 millimeters of travel, you just... There's not a lot you can do with the internal stuff, yeah. right? You just can't build the, the, you don't have the range of piston speed to really you know, go from this circuit to that circuit to the next circuit uh, as you drive speed. Um, and, um, and they were all, like I say, pretty spindly, small. Uh, they just didn't allow for that, that much travel. So it wasn't you know, until we started being able to, you know, the, the industry, the riders started embracing uh, longer travel, uh, did we get into damping systems that actually would allow us to do, uh, you know, blend and use these multi-circuits um, to control the ride. So when you see the components today, and this even goes from our cross-country race bike, which is an Epic at 100 millimeters of travel, that travel, that piston speed allows us to kind of replicate everything that's going on in the motocross stuff. It's smaller, maybe lighter. Um, I'm sure it's lighter. Uh, but the sophistication of what we're asking it to do through the speed range is probably uh, very similar. Obviously, the theories are a little different on what we're trying to do with human powered and, and you know, a 22 pound bike versus, you know, versus uh, sure. the bigger bike. Yeah. Um, but if you get inside there, I mean, you yourself as a shock tuner, you'd get in there and go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I know what that is. Boy, that's awful small, but I know what that is. <laughs> um, how funny was it to be basically up against where you started though? You're at RockShock, Fox is a big competitor in that market. <laughs> you're, you basically come full circle and you're against where you started. <laughs> it, you know, it's, uh, all I can say is, uh, I think I've done a good job of not burning too many bridges along the way because they still let me in the doors of these places. So you're exactly right. So I was a big part of RockShocks and then I went to Fox um, and was, uh, uh, I can't remember what the title is, doesn't really matter. 
a you VP. It was a VP of the bike division and then also helped in the off-road uh, truck division. And they had another guy doing the motorcycle stuff. Um, but it was funny because, um, I mean, truth be told, we were all up here in San Jose at the time. Fox is up here. RockShox is up here. And RockShox had some new ownership after the IPO. And to be honest, I left RockShox and was down here. I was uh, heading up the engineering department for Mike, for Senior, for Specialized. And Bob Fox and I were working on some projects. And, uh, you know, he was having a hard time kind of getting traction with Fox because they were just in the rear shock market. He, he wasn't really didn't have enough engineers to really get into the fork market, wasn't sure how to bridge that gap to invest to get into the fork market. And it was, you know, so we used to have a lot of conversations. He'd asked about me coming on board, but I was pretty content doing what I was doing at Specialized. And the wheels just started falling off at RockShox. They had a new CEO. He didn't know, they were, you know, they're after, the, uh, after the, uh, the IPO. And he goes, we're going to move to Colorado Springs. That's going to save everything. But what happened was all the, all the very experienced guys wanted to stay here in the Bay Area. That's where they're from. And so I was able to, the, the timing was right. I went back and said, Bob, we can do this. And we got a bunch of the really good guys that were at RockShox, to be honest, who worked for me in the advanced R&D group and the engineering group who were eager to come over and kind of bring all that tribal knowledge, not intellectual property, but just understanding of what was going on and kind of reboot Fox. And I mean, if you go back in the history books, you'll see Rock Shocks whack because uh, they went to the Springs and just ended up almost going out of business. I think they did, Shram bought them for a dime on the dollar. Um, but all of a sudden Fox turned around and, and just took off to the moon. And it was really because all the good talent that had been there through the period, that five-year period of growing it and taking it public, just shifted over to, to Fox and, and got it going. So it's interesting when you ask that question because for a long time you go into Fox and it felt a lot like Rock Shocks because it was so many of the personnel. And even today, a lot of those really good guys running that company, you can trace their roots back to Rock Shocks as well. So there was a lot of us. But then the Rock Shocks that we know today is built with a whole new team of people. Yeah. They weren't, there's not, I, there might be one or two guys that were there in those days, but everybody else is new. And we have a really strong working relationship with them, but it's a whole new company. Yeah. This, is, this is a fast forward, but I got to ask you just because yeah. I feel like I'm going to forget this question later on. Yeah. Um, you know, mountain biking market, there, there are some boutique brands of suspension, but really I think if even from the outside looking and people with very little knowledge know it's Rock Shock and Fox, mm -hmm. and then Old Leans has been making the push here. Yep. And of course, back in the moto days, that was the premier. That was yeah, it's gold, man. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it's gold. Swedish gold. But uh, Swedish like gold. gold. But is that pretty? Is that another funny one? Because now, and you, you know, Specialized has taken up a lot of really unique projects with um, Old Lean. So you've gotten to work with quite a bit of that, huh? Yeah. Is that kind of a cool come around as well? It, it is, uh, because again, you know, my involvement in these two companies, and so I'm going to give you the lowdown here. Um, and uh, so I'm in Taiwan at one of the factories uh, that we use for sourcing parts. And these are, it's a premier suspension supplier in Asia, uh, in Taiwan. You know, Rock Shocks, we used to buy a lot of parts out of these, this place, also Fox. So I was there looking on some of the projects. And so the owner says, hey, uh, you know, the COO uh, from Olin's is in town because they buy shafts and bodies and ship them to Sweden. Do you mind if he comes to lunch with us? And I said, heck no, I'd love to meet him. And so this guy's name was uh, Heinrich Johansson. He's now the CEO of Olin's, but he was the chief operating officer at that time. And so it was a great lunch because we had a lot of, uh, you know, people that we knew from the motorcycle industry. So we went back to the factory. I did my stuff. He did his. And then that night for dinner, same thing. You know, the, the owner of the factory takes us all out to dinner. So we ended up uh, getting to know each other on that trip. He invited me to Sweden to see if there was maybe some technology we would like to license. But, uh, you know, meeting with Brandon Sloan and the team here, we decided, you know, let's see if we can't get them into the bike space. And one of the things that Heinrich told me is he goes, you know, we know suspension technology. We're Olin's, we've been doing this in all these different disciplines. We just don't know the, mi the mountain bike market very well. And so we've stayed out of it because of that. And so the whole idea was we went in there and said, hey, guys, we know the mountain bike market. You know suspension technology. Let's partner up. And so if you, you know, if you followed it, there was some early stuff that's been launched. And then in the beginning, they were uh, you know, working very closely with us. And that was part of the early agreement that together we would help, you know, aim that, that 
you know, they're like this big cannon when it comes to understanding the technology and help them kind of hit the target. And it's funny for them, um, their success, their early success in the mountain bike space totally outpaced what they could do on a manufacturing side. And so uh, much, t and those guys are so smart, it was kind of like they went full speed and then all of a sudden they couldn't really control production. Quality issues were developing and they just put the brakes on. We put the brakes on. They went and built a whole new factory and they've got everything dialed and now they're starting to roll up. So what you're gonna see is, there was kind of that, herp, they're on the scene and then it was a little bit quiet. A little bit and, of a lull. And yeah. now they're they're rolling back because we've been testing all their new product. It's what we would expect from Olean's. Um, you know, the relationship is still really strong, but you'll see that they're gonna you know, be, uh, they're now able to actually, they take care of all their own aftermarket sales. They've got their distribution group. They're gonna, uh, they'll go wider with OEM sales. Um, so the product is gonna be out there and they're gonna be a player, they're in it. Um, and again, they, uh, you know, they were excited, they got going and they said, whoa, uh, that we will be successful here, and then they just slowed it down a little oh, bit. They took a step back to get their stuff together. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more sinking. of that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Because there's a there's a supplier base that supports all these guys, whether it be Fox or Rockshox, and it takes years. I mean, sometimes close to ten years to get all the shaft guys, the seal guys, the die casting guys, all all those guys that supply you to get really good guys that can can deliver the quality that you need. Because as you know. The, you know, one part, one O-ring that's not to spec, and then you've got a product in the field that's failing, and you have all kinds of issues. So, it can literally, it can literally, especially thinking of like yeah. Air Fork stuff. It can literally be a ten cents O-ring that just makes your fork completely collapse yes. over and over. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and I've seen the rest that of the fork can be amazing. Ten yeah. cent O-ring, you're effed. Yeah, all the pictures of that thing coming back collapsed. So. Uh, so anyways, they're fun, and, and the reason they're fun to work with, because it sounds like you were over there, is they're so friggin' smart. I mean, they have so much, and I've always had so much respect for them. I mean, in the days working with Bob Fox and stuff, I mean, we just held them up here, and we would, when we were challenging stuff, we would always look at, hey, what's, how's Olean's doing that? How are they, you know, guiding that shaft? And um, just because they have, they've been a, a market leader for so long in the spaces, and they're, you know, they're that way. They didn't want to get in because they they didn't, it was important to them to be, you know, in the top tier. And so with the partnership with Specialized, we we, we kind of gave them, I don't want to say gave them, but it, it was that opportunity to bridge that gap. But now, you know, now they've got so many engineers that are racing and riding and they brought people in. So they've got a real good mountain bike culture when you go there. The um, the funny one is listening you talk to them OEM sales made me think of another one is it, it's similar to the conversation we had earlier about how you guys at Kawasaki started doing your own suspension because like I said you in KYB and Show's case um, all these OEMs have their own suspension guys for the race team and their own suspension guys on the production side well yes they get information they get their components mm -hmm. and they buy them there. Mm -hmm. They develop what comes stock on a case stock on a Yamaha stock mm -hmm. on a Honda kind of themselves. When did mountain bike kings start at that point? Because right now, that's basically what you do here. Yeah. You guys buy components from only mm -hmm. Fox, Rock Shock, mm -hmm. whatever. You guys develop your own settings, basically, yeah. for the most part. Um, like in your time at Rock Shock, when did you see brands start to do that? Well, it was funny because they weren't doing it. And, my, and so the early days of Rock Shocks, and that was one of the strengths of Rock Shocks because I just came out of the motorcycle industry where we were doing that for everybody through Factory Connection, and then you know Pro Circuit was starting to do it. Um, as was Paul Theed, you had all these guys. And so I was just keyed into the importance and, and also leaving the motorcycle industry where uh, I saw even in those days, they were trying to get it dialed where, you know, the R&D group, production R&D group was working with Kayaba to get the KXs to, to ride really well. And I saw how much effort was put into that. So then you come into the bicycle space and the bicycle companies have no idea what's going on. And so it was really, us understanding how to go out and test this stuff and valve it. So in the early days, we did all that. We had a really good program at RockShox, but then as the industry grew, as the component spec grew, as full suspension came out there, we weren't able to keep up with doing all the custom tuning and the companies at that time didn't have programs that would we could work with. We had basically had to do all of it for whatever the bike brand was. So what we started to do was simplify it. So we basically, if we had a rear shock design that we were sending to an OE customer, we would give them one one setting and then we had one that was a little bit firmer and then one that was a little bit softer and so we'd always start with the middle one and then they'd come back and say oh, you know that thing's a little soft we'd give them the other one it was always better 
yeah, that's it. And then they basically had three SKUs, three part numbers to pick from. And that's still the program they run today. So I knew, understood, I pioneered that program to help us manufacture, but I also knew there was some compromise. And so as this market has matured, one of the things that Senior and I had talked about was, you know, what kind of advantages could we give Specialized by building our own in-house uh, group? So the, my group designs stuff like brain shocks and forks and if, anything that we think we need or work with companies like Olean's um, on custom product or whatever that is, or Fox or, or Rock Shocks. But also if we're going to, on their inline product, um, not that they don't, they, they have guys that'll come and work with us and we work really closely with them, but we also have a vision of what we want that bike to do. And so we don't want to farm that vision out to somebody and tell them, you know, if they, if they have some ideas, I'm always willing to learn on how to get through, you know, make the bike work. Uh, we always test it and everything else, but we also have the wherewithal and experience in-house to make the final call on how we set up spring rates. Um, air springs, you know, um, the curves, all that stuff, and then also the damping rates. And it's you understand, because you've been the shock tuner, uh, there's theories involved. You keep saying me, tuner. I say I'm the guy that disassembles <laughs> yeah. it and knows how it goes together. I'm not, I'm not claiming okay. tuner here by a mile. <laughs> I'm sure you've tried it, though. I've because tried. we all try it. Once you learn how to take one apart and put it together, then I'm you I'm not going to claim to be that successful. All right. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But there's a lot of theories on what you want to happen, and that becomes your proprietary technology. And that's something, once I share that with the Fox guys and I tell them, hey, I like this kind of curve because it does this, it becomes their knowledge as well, right? And so whenever possible, we like to keep that to ourselves. It's still, <laughs> yeah, it's still the old racer in me, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, actually, it was funny you mentioned Paul Theater because Paul, his son races, uh, pretty much races cross country and all that. Mm -hmm. His son's really into it, and I see Paul time at cross country races, so I'm always teasing him like, "So, when's race tech gonna get a mountain bike?" So, <laughs> he's not, always teasing him he about should it. Should be. I I wouldn't say that he might not be thinking about it. Finally, yeah. I, I love teasing him about it, though because I always see him at it at some cross country races. But um, no, just that huge Ooh. crossover still of so many guys I run into. Yeah. I was going to ask you, how, how difficult is it dealing with, um, we, we look at how OEMs uh, on motorcycle, we, we get a bike and that's all we can buy it as. A lot of people know mountain biking, you can buy a lot of different specifications mm -hmm. of the exact same bike. One, two, maybe three different frame materials across the build, but different shifting components, weights of stuff, and then the big one is suspension. Mm -hmm. So you have a mountain bike that you're developing. Mm -hmm. um, you might work with anywhere from two, you might work with Fox, RockShock, and Olean's across the entire range of what's available for that bike. Yeah. You have different price points to me. Mm -hmm. You're always trying to produce the best quality mm -hmm. of ride, but you also have to rein it in at times. Um, how how difficult is that? <laughs> That's my that's my uh, dilemma right there. It's that's my burden. Uh, it it can be challenging for sure because the reason we have the three models is to hit these price points, right? Because we, it's very easy, believe it or not, to design this really high end bitchin' bike, but to deliver it at a price point that you and I could afford, eh, you know, we still got to ratchet it down a little bit. And then there's this price point, this price point. And the, the importance of being able to deliver the best product at that price point. So, um, so that's exactly what we have to do. So, uh, when we have a new frame design, and we understand the the good, better, best uh, positioning of it, and that will the suspension components are a big driver in that because there'll be some lower cost forks and shocks that go on it, so that we can hit the price point. But for us in our suspension group, we will pull everything that we know uh, out of the, the bag of tricks to tune these things. And what's interesting, because like the, the last Stumpy that we developed, once we come up with our golden sample, and it might be achieved with you know the high-end Fox shock in our testing and the fork, because we pay a lot of attention to the front and back and how they work, and our frame uh, chassis dyno in the back allows us to do that, right? It's that, you know, uh, you know matching the curves all the way through the stroke so that they have a balance. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to that, um, as well as damping, yeah, obviously front to rear. Uh, just that keeping that balance uh, uh, intact because it's it's easy, and you see that a lot in our industry where they're focusing on the rear shock, and then they might spec a fork from somebody else, and then it's up to the PM, the product manager, to go out. Yeah, I think that's okay, but we do a ton of data acquisition, ton of measuring to make sure these things are blended. But 
once we have a, a bike that we really like, that the ride characteristics are in line with what the PMs, the product managers are trying to do, obviously with through Dyno and data acquisition, we can quantify that. And then we can start getting into some of the, the lower cost components that maybe don't have the sophistication, but we know what kind of spring curve we're trying to mimic. We know what kind of damping curve we want. And so we'll use everything, all the little tricks uh, that we've learned over the years to manipulate those damping systems to lay out. Now we will get into situations where we just can't, right? The, um, but we get it as close to, to, the, to the, the master curve as we can. Now, I was curious how much of this is, is your job. I'm guessing this might be a little more of a project manager or product manager, but I'm sure the son you deal with. So you're, you've got your top of line S works model with whatever kit setup is that you're that's top of the price point. You guys are happy with how it performs. You're down working on that $5,000 bike and got this combination of parts going and you're, you're testing and you end up maybe say suspension wise, you're in a situation where, okay, the setting that works in that price range that gets us there, we're teetering on yeah. if it's okay, but here's this we could run, puts us at a great setup for a $5,000 bike, and it's, you know, our mid-range bike, and it's it's uh, all that parts, that combination of parts is a $10 more. Do you guys then deal with like the project managers, like, hey, is there somewhere else on the bike we can change a crank or something like, like this, this little change in suspension is worth so much for the final product bike. Can we, can we find somewhere else so we can retain yeah. this? Now you did a great job of, of kind of replaying the discussions that go on here all the time. So we get to certain, I mean, all the way through the product uh, range, but we, we work so closely with the product managers that when we end up you know, in a situation like that, because we'll lay a design completely out on the table and we'll lay the other ones and we'll say, hey, because of the way they're, they're controlling the rebound circuit on here, we're gonna have some issues. And so we, you know, we might do the deep dive and come up with some, some concerns and then it's the PMs working with them because all of the, the testing that we do, uh, we have good test riders within my group, but it's still the product managers here, at Specialized anyways, are all really good riders and they participate in that, uh, uh, that testing as well. So when we get to that, we have that kind of uh, discussion and it's if it's significant enough, they might downspec a derailleur to get that other shock design on there because of the improvement that it makes. So it is one of those where we season to taste um, and actually see what it is. But if we, if we identify something as you just described, that's probably what would happen. You'd see an up spec on the shock and a down spec on something else that somebody else could up spec. Maybe it's a handlebar, right? But then the guy can up spec to a carbon yeah. Gucci bar. And, but the overall balance of the bike he loves. So yeah, that's what happens year to year. And it's always changing, right? Cause their components are changing and it's like, oh, that shock had a terrible rebound circuit. Now they've got it dialed. That'll work. I love the way they they modified the air spring on this new model year. It's going to work really well. So, always a give and take like that. Yeah. And there's sometimes where we get some of the cheaper shocks that perform better because they don't have all that crap that's adjusting. Yeah. You don't have as many circuits in it. Yeah. yeah you know what? All that adjustment, man. Sometimes they can get in there and just muck up the fluid yeah. flow. Hey, I, I've joked with people, even just thinking of like. <laughs> Me and, me and Ross had this conversation one day. I asked him what he thought of, of modern day motocross suspension. I think yeah. was his answer he goes, there's too much adjustment for the general guy in there, dude. They can make way too, yeah. <laughs> they can get way too far off in left field. They can yeah. dan bind up stuff way yeah. too much, closing yeah. stuff off. And um, yeah, there. it's funny. A lot of guys think like, oh, the more adjustment, the better. Yeah. And some of the stuff I've written with the most possible circuits to adjust on sometimes ends up interfering with itself so much. It's ugh. And I Exactly. And I mean, one of the things that we do here, and you know, having been on that side as an OEM shock supplier, and so you got a design team, you almost have to uh, design the, the range of adjustment. What we used to refer to as shit to shit because it was a shitty ride up here and it was a shitty ride down there. And somewhere in the middle was the right ride. But uh, as you were just, as Ross alluded to, you find guys that live out here, right? And they yeah. just, man, ah, this thing sucks. They don't know why. But on the designs that we control, like the Epic Rear Shock is a good example. Here, we know the bike, we know the application, we've got really good rider feedback from all the way up and down. And so there's, a, there's five clickers, five compression adjustments um, on the brain, and it's, it's, it's within the workable range that you should be in, right? There's no shit to shit. It's, yeah, you're it's not all wasting there. their time. You're exactly. in the, the meat to the And they know, and that's the way we promote this thing, is all of those are w workable, usable settings, depending on what you're doing. And same with the rebound. Yeah. But having 
design these other things where I'm not really sure what they're going on, a lot of times those clickers, those adjusters have to have a broad range. I try to explain it to somebody sometimes. I mean, I'm go, hey, so I'm, you know, my setting, I'm, I'm all the way here. I'm like two out. So yeah, it's got 20 clicks of adjustment. That's fine, right? I'm like, you're all the way at like two. I'm like, eh, like eh, okay, okay. You might want to take that back. There's a way yeah. to get you back in the middle there somewhere. Yeah. But yeah. Um, the, the other crazy one, like I'm just staring right now in the room we're in, uh, mm-hmm. this, this picture of Sam Hill on a, uh, an older downhill bike, 26 inch wheels. And that's been the biggest mm-hmm. talk of the town for mountain biking the past few years is this giant range, this, this yeah. shift of, I would say the two is the biggest thing. Like when I started my last job at Valmax, we had a MTB site and it was right as they were starting to move to 27.5. The 29ers were still these real mm-hmm. rare and then 27.5 became accepted. And also I'm starting to hear the guys now say, oh, these new all mountain bikes are great. And then that kind of shifted over to Enduro. And mm-hmm. now we have trail bikes are coming great. It's just been like a mass four to five years of changing demographics of what you're trying to hit with all these bikes. So I imagine for you guys, you've been dealing with changes in wheel size. You've been dealing probably with a lot of different linkage ratio, like linkage yeah. designs, because you're going from downhill guy, downhill bikes are getting more and more specialized in the term of they are just pure downhill. You have an enduro that fits in between. Guys yeah. are getting on trail bikes. Yeah. Uh, what's been the biggest, what do you feel like has been the biggest challenge for you guys to wrap your head around? Has it been the wheel size? The, the, wheel, changing the wheel size, for sure. If you just yeah. take the, the last five years as a snapshot, um, because of the advantages all the way around that, you know, believe it or not, there probably is an advantage to the 26 inch wheel. I, I just, it, it escapes me <laughs> right now. Probably the acceleration, right? At the rear wheel, well, but less mass to rotate. Exactly. Sorry, yeah. And, and, um, but just chasing that around, I mean, there was actually, you know, some wide tires coming out, wide rims coming out. That's the answer. Then it was, you know, 29, 27 fives. And, um, and for us and even the fork makers, um, to to figure out you know the clearance needed because when you design a magnesium casting for years it just had to fit the 26 inch and you had a wide tire and and you could design these things there was a period there where uh, I know Aline's got caught up in it I think uh, Fox probably did as well they had castings that they were just releasing and they were already obsolete because of where the market was shifting and they're scrambling to get a 29 inch casting in place. So it was a challenge for the industry to get it sorted out, but we're kind of moving to an area where I think it's pretty good. You know, I, uh, we were po- we were looking at that Loic Bruni. Um, you know, he just won that first uh, World Cup over in Maribor on a 29-inch front and a 27.5 rear. So about to get to the yeah. most moto feeling thing I've ever tried. I tried a <laughs> a, a, a bike uh, recently that has a 29 front, 27.5 rear, and yep. to be honest, this sounds really dumb. I didn't notice it when I grabbed. I grabbed said bike, jumped yeah. on road, and then instantly something clicked with me. I'm like, something's really weird. And I stopped and looked. I'm like, oh, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't even realize for a second that's yeah. why I jumped on. But uh, coming from moto, of course, that seems natural. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what What's been like? So you guys are testing stuff like that. What's yep. that's that's just come up because downhill bikes. I mean, like I said, 27.5 became fairly accepted in downhill. And then last year was the the giant push of 29. Yeah. You know, the first World Cup guys are on prototype frames to accept it. Fox is trying to rush out 29, forks. accepting yeah. forks, and everybody's yeah. losing their mind over that. And also when we get to the end off season now, people are talking about, oh, well, maybe we'll put 27.5 on the back yeah. too. Yeah. Jeez. So I, you know, having, <laughs> having been involved in some of that testing, oh I mean, the, the 20, the bigger wheels, I mean, there's no doubt rolls over the over the terrain better, right? The rougher the terrain, it rolls over it and stuff. But there's more going on in motocross and any of the stuff that we do, right? Especially in downhill racing. And so what can happen, especially at that very, very high level, those big wheels in the back, especially just the length and everything needed it. For these guys, they just need that whole back end to be a little firmer. And when I'm not, I'm not talking about suspension movement, just stiffness. And there's a too much wheel flex on like twin, too much yeah, area to flex, on the too bigger much wheels leverage and, of the exactly, wheel. Exactly, exactly. And then you got longer stays, chain uh, swing arms, and all these other things that you're trying to control and all that other stuff. These guys, it's um, it's almost like what we were talking about in Supercross. The, they need the suspension to gobble up the bumps for sure, but they. They, there can't be a vagueness. Yeah, they need a certain amount of playfulness. They need to be able to set the bike into stuff. They and, need and to be able feel, to pop it. And exactly, and control exactly. It. And so for us in the testing we've done with Bruni, there's certain courses where he likes 29-29. There's an advantage and he sees it, but there's other stuff 
and it's probably the rougher stuff where he the line picking and being able to to the playfulness to hop to, and really place that somewhere and have that vagueness gone and just be boom I'm there boom I'm there um, where getting the smaller stiffer wheel back in there shorter stays uh, helps achieve that so I think we're finally at a spot where we know what works and what doesn't but uh, uh, but it was painful there for a while because it was it seemed more politics than actual uh, <laughs> well, um, I, and performance I under, driven. And I can understand looking at riders. I laugh looking at, um, oh my goodness, his his name is escaping me. Um, world champ. Uh, I think it's it's Greg Minar. Is really yeah, big, Minar. really yeah. big guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So funny looking at a picture. It like the picture of him on old twenty six inch bike. You look yeah. at him on a twenty nine er now. It yeah. looks very fitting, but look, and some of the smaller riders yeah. like look very, yeah. very unusual on tires. So I could see now we're getting into the point of of the argument of where like a certain wheel size to a rider size starts. So I can see why bigger guys are probably more comfortable, and little guys are probably like this feels like it's overkilled. Yeah. Um, you even with doing the big front tire, you're dealing with front end, like how quick it reacts and steers. Um, funny one, I've always wondered why. Uh, from your experience in testing, mm-hmm. why has an upside down fork never been more popular even in the down? I understand why it's yeah. not really popular in the in the shorter travel ranges, but uh, like even in downhill, it, it I, I think Old Lean's played with it for a little yep. bit and they went back to uh, a traditional yep. setup, right? Yep. And it's, it's one of those, it's that age old dilemma, right? There's advantages and disadvantages. And I think, uh, I hate to say it, but it's probably more of a, uh, a manufacturing, um, not to say a manufacturing, um, because they can manufacture the upside down ones. The the designs tend to be a little bit heavier in that they've got these conventional forks dialed. The type of bumps that these guys are hitting are not like motocross. That's one of the things we think that it's motocross but it's more like enduro riding and I know the enduro guys, uh, off-road guys in the motorcycle world run upside down forks, but there was a they time. They like a less rigid fork. Though, exactly. Yeah. And these guys benefit from that as well. Sometimes that preci- that stiffness works against them. Um, just because what what happens is without that flex happening below that triple crown, tri- triple crown, when the forks is flexing, it doesn't yeah, interfere four, with yeah. the sliding. Yeah. You want, it, you want to minimize that, but there's still going to be some of it, but it doesn't affect the sliding action. Um, as you know, on, on some of the upside down forks, if they're too stiff in that area, then it's where the stanchion tube is ent- ent- entering the fork and then where the axle is, uh, is where the flex has to uh, take place or a binding, right? And so when you're smacking rocks, roots, which is really all those guys do, yes, they jump, but um, it seems like uh, more times than not, this fork, th- this fork layout works works better. I'm not saying there won't be an upside down fork, but I think there's been some attempts, but then a kind of a retreat to what's known. Um, is it, would you say, is it mostly coming from the way the force is, is applied? Because I think of like yeah. a guy in Supercross landing off a triple into a bullhorn. He is landing into a little bit of braking shop. You have so much downward force exactly. from the landing, exactly. so much force of like the engine braking. Yeah. But in mountain bike, you've got more, I think of like moto is the fork has pressures pushing it down a lot more. Where mountain biking, you're more or less hitting an obstacle going forward. Yeah. Yeah. So the fork isn't as easily going uh, it's kind of being pushed back yeah, at the same time more. exactly okay yeah, that's a great it's a great analysis so so in moto you're you're slamming into stuff more yeah. like dropping down with force yeah. but in mountain biking you're more or less running into something that's yeah. that's causing travel and it, and again you know if you look at like when you're setting up like for a race right you, you kind of look at the obstacles of the course and you you set up accordingly and, and you might be compromised over here but it's because you you solve for something over here. And I think the upside down fork in general in motocross solve for so many more things. But if, if we were, you know, if the guys were hitting long sections of rocks, roots, breaking bumps and everything else, if that was the majority of the course, the conventional fork would probably still be around with a little more flex on it, but it's not, right? And to your point, the way the loads are, are being applied to this thing to the to the front end of a motorcycle, the fork works very well in that in that space. But for us, uh, like I say, it's 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 not really supercross. It's not really motocross. It's more of like an off road. I mean, if you look at some of this stuff, well, you can't really see it, but you you ride it. You know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. 
<clears throat> well, it makes me think too, because I've noticed in World Cup the last year or two, um, data acquisition becoming more and more popular mm -hmm. for the riders to run in, in test sessions and in practice. And it's kind of funny is in, in Moto Supercross, I definitely see more teams running in qualifying sessions, but having also seen some of that data, I, I feel like it's so hard to quantify what it what it does because even in Supercross, even though it's it's of all the situations of moto, it's the one with the least amount of variance. There's still so many variables going into why it did that. It's hard to sometimes, I feel like, take that data. You, I feel like it's usable when you're kind of overlapping it with the writer's comment to find things, but on its own, it seems to be really hard to use it. Now, I kind of think of mountain biking somewhere, okay, you have constant changing conditions. You have the rider's weight on the bike can be an input change, but you also don't have as many, I would think, different ways force is applied, like moto, you don't have the engine braking, you don't have as much falling force, much weight. Uh, would you say that because of that, is the data acquisition for you guys in mountain biking a little bit easier to quantify than it is in moto to use that data to actively make a change or go a direction? Yeah. I, you know, I haven't used it for a long time in moto, so, uh, but listening to what you're saying, I kind of remember it you know, we used to do a lot of data acquisition to kind of get our bearings with the setup, but then we didn't use it a lot, but the teams are a whole lot more sophisticated than we were back in the day. But the way our team uses it here, and for sure our downhill team that's based in um, in France, they'll have Bruni, Loke Bruni, and also Finn, uh, they have a data acquisition bike and they have the race bike and they're set up identical. And what they use it for is track setup. So they have their the bike setup that they like, and um, the thing about motocross um, that I used to love is I could stand on a track and I could watch, right? Yeah, you can sit there and, yeah. and I can watch them, right? Go around the, and around and around and around and practice, right? And I could walk a few feet and I can see a different section, right? But in that doesn't happen at <laughs> You've seen it, dude. So there think about trying to set up suspension. You're going, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And you're like, and it was like, shh. And then it's 20 minutes till he comes again, did, right? Did that look like it worked there? Should yeah. we walk? Well, then yeah. they're like, do we stay here to see a second run through to see if it's consistent? Yeah, yeah. Or do we walk down and watch yeah, the next Another thing? second. Yeah, so it's to scrutinize as a tuner, you're like, screwed. So the good shock tuners for downhill mountain bike in uh, Jack from Jack Racing, who's part of our gravity team over in um, France, he's a guy that's been around forever. Motocross, the early days of downhill, he is so good at it. And he and Kevin, the other mechanic, they have these data acquisition bikes and that's that's their eyes on the course. And so they look at it and they the things they check for is front to back balance. Where are we at in the stroke? Are we too deep into the stroke? So they, they'll do a, you know, they can look at histograms from the percentage of the run. Are, are we deep in the stroke? Are we high in the stroke? Are we getting to the end of the stroke? So there's certain formulas that they like to see. So based on that, they'll adjust and tweak the bike. So. And there is such, there's a variation uh, between the courses, enough variation between the courses where it's helpful. So these guys are really good. And I, I've just spent two trips uh, in February and in December, I was in France working with these guys and they're so good at it. And I was impressed, you know, just, they're just looking at the data just to set these bikes up. And, you know, within a few runs reading that stuff, they had the front and back just working really good. And uh, so, that's how we use it. We do the same for our downhill testing, or not our downhill, but just all of our, our, our testing here. It's just to, uh, it's just kind of our eyes because uh, I can't get them to go around in a circle for me. <laughs> so the speaking of downhill, I mean, it is so cool to see where those bikes are at, but less and less people are buying them because yeah. enduro bikes have become amazing, trail bikes have become amazing. Would you have guessed five years ago that you would guys would hit the point you are now, how good those bikes have gone in just the few years that that kind of middle ground of bikes yeah. has, has changed so much? I, you know, that's a, I, I, I'd have to say yes. <laughs> the only reason I say that is because we're so driven here to, to innovate and keep moving forward. And um, what's, the, what's the company slogan? Innovate or die? That's right. I don't want to die yet, <laughs> so I got to keep innovating. But um, yeah, you know, it's 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 funny because um, I, you're you're right. I mean, some of these enduros. I mean, they. In fact, a lot of our downhill guys, you know, prefer those bikes yeah. in certain applications for sure. But at the World Cup, I mean, that's all they're going to race. But it's interesting because I love that sport. It's fun to watch. Um, but it's you, you know you 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 got to live by a bike park. You got to really 
you know, embrace it to, to your point. We don't sell a lot of them, but it's it's a great place for us to develop technology. It does trickle down. A lot of the stuff that we're learning, we find its way onto the Enduros and then also um, down onto the cross-country trail. So it, it, is a, it is hugely beneficial, but yeah, the capability of these bikes are, are pretty amazing. Well, I'm down to my bottom too, and we'll get we'll get out of here. But um, for for somebody that has a basic understanding of motocross suspension or how the forces are applied, like just just kind of understand it. Mm-hmm. What would you tell them if they come up to you and want to know? Well, what's the biggest difference between motocross suspension and like how you set up a downhill bike, and then what's the biggest difference between even that and say a cross country bike? Like, how would you describe it to somebody? Well, you know, for like a downhill bike is similar to what we'd be doing on a motocross bike where it's all about, you know, bump absorption. Um, you know, there's a term called comfort. I, I've had a hard time embracing that because to me, comfort was never a part of it. It's about speed, right? But in suspension terms, if you go into other industries, comfort is really about how well that thing is working, gobbling up the bumps. When I say comfort, it's not so we can be comfortable, yeah. but it's actually that it's working and going over the bumps. So in downhill racing, the again, you know, we, we were talking about pedal efficiency earlier. These guys do have to pedal and they sprint out of corners and stuff. So you have to have some of it, but it's all about momentum carry. And momentum carry is is when the suspension is working, it's balanced. Uh, these guys can drive hard into the lines and they get cornering, braking. All that stuff is 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 dialed in to where they just get that flow. And so when we're setting up suspension, that's what we're looking for. Now, when we go to cross country, there's more of an emphasis because of what we learned in downhill racing, the importance of speed and that momentum carry and the damping curves and the spring curves that allow us to, to continue to, to carry that speed through the bumps. Because in cross country, if you, if you, you don't have to go back too many years where they would still ride hardtails. And it's good until you have to go through some speed or some bumps. And if there's bumps in your climbing or whatever, what happens is a hardtail maybe is very efficient to accelerate but if you start hitting bumps, you decelerate, and then you have to accelerate, and then you decelerate. So with our full suspension bikes, the emphasis is on having efficiency, which comes through some technology, proprietary technology, which is that inertia valve what we call the brain. But that gives us almost a firmness like a hardtail to pedal up to speed. But then we've spent so much time working on how that thing uh, works once you're up to speed going over the bumps so that it has that momentum carry attribute that a downhill bike does. So that, a lot of people, you know, when I tell them, you know, we learned a lot about how to make an XC bike faster by what we do on downhill, right? It's, it's that curve, the blow off curve, the flat curve, not overproducing because of the, the weight of the vehicle. But the, um, so that's, that's kind of the difference. We need that efficiency, that shock absorber to get us up to speed, but then we need to, 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 to be able to keep the momentum carry. Where that one, you don't have to worry so much about getting up to speed uh, because gravity does it right in the downhill. Actually, something else just popped. I feel so bad. This is one of me and ask you. What's it? The because um, you're in you you being suspension, you're always dealing with the mountain bikes. Yes. The company massive in road, and now they're starting to become a little bit of a crossover. I know you have yes. a meeting later today with uh, one of the two main specialized professional road teams. You have the Bore Hands Grow Team and the Quick Step Team. Yep. And uh, typically we'd see Quick Step on like the the Venge, the most aerodynamic road bike you have. They got a lot of spurs, they're big in the one day classics. Um, and Or the one, any kind of like one day, short, shorter one, three day uh, style racing. But biggest thing is uh, moving into the cobble races. We've gone road bikes now, or per se going into what is becoming the gravel segment. We're getting road bikes that now have suspension based systems on it. And so probably for years of working in this company is, is this, I would guess your involvement now in that segment is the highest it's ever been as you now actually have suspension systems on a road bike. Uh, Put blank. What are you guys trying to accomplish there? Because that's got to be hard. Because you're dealing with guys that definitely want no flex, nothing moving. They want the most power transfer possible of a bike, yeah. and then you're trying to give them comfort at the yes. same time. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. And that's why it's probably taken so long for any type of suspension, true suspension um, components to to get on that level of a road bike and be taken seriously. And my involvement in that because. Um, it goes back a long time ago. The early days of Rock Shocks, and this would have been 93, 94, and 95, we made suspension forks and took them to Perry Roubaix. It was Greg LeMond who contacted Rock Shocks early on, and he said, Hey, we're doing Perry Roubaix. 
um, through the cobblestones, can you make me a couple forks, one for my bike, one for my teammates? So Paul, we built four bikes, or excuse me, four forks. Paul took them over. Um, they used them for Perry roubaix uh, They had great success with it. Uh, they didn't win it that year. The next year we went back and had forks for all of Greg's team, the GAN team, and uh, one of his teammates, uh, Duclos LaSalle, won the event with it. We then went back two more years, and, and by the fourth year we had the 80% of the Peloton on these RockShox forks. So that, to be honest, that started, we, so we were looking hard at it, believe it or not, in the early 90s at RockShox. Is there a commercial product that could come out of this? What we were finding was, hey, it was fine for the one-day classic through the Pave. But even as that race was maturing, France was paving over a lot of those cobblestone streets. And in the early days, you could go from Paris all the way to Roubaix, Belgium, on cobblestones, right? But uh, if you if you follow the race now, they actually have to go find the cobblestone, right? Because they, they're not they're not as many, uh, many sections as there used to be. So even the court, the race itself doesn't have as much cobblestone. So they kind of started moving away from that. But during that time, I had done a lot of work through with the RockShox R&D group about that momentum carry that I was talking about earlier. And it is real, and especially on the road bikes as well. So we had done some work with McLaren, and we were finding out smoother is faster is one of our new taglines. But it's, it's about that momentum carry. When, you, when you're taking a, an unsuspended mass, that's the rider's weight in the, in the road bike, and it has to hit a bump to continue forward. It's going to, it's got to move this way before it goes over, right? And it's that, it's that decoupling. If you can just decouple the mass, then the momentum continues to move without having to be disrupted. Um, yeah, basically, get up and over. As a fork moves up, the momentum carries forward easier. As you basically have an object that's impacting, has its own exactly. its own axis to move on. And so we had done a bunch of work, and this is the early days of mountain bike in suspending the seat. And uh, we all know those old comfort seat posts and stuff, but we made these apparatuses that were four bar linkage systems with coil shocks in there. They were, they were contraptions, but it was all about, hey, if we really manage suspending the seat, what does that do to a mountain bike? And it was amazing. If you, if you were seated, you could, we had a hundred millimeter, you, bam, you could just go into curbs and the thing would doosh, doosh. And the reason it works is because the mountain bike is so light that the frame can can move quickly like a swing arm. I mean, a, a whole road bike is lighter than a swing arm on a, a motocross bike. And so what it means is you don't necessarily need to suspend the wheel, but the mass is in the rider. And so, again, having done that work when we were trying to solve for this on the Roubaix up front, I kind of pulled from those experiences. And we had a, a small group of advanced uh, R&D guys, myself, Chris DeLuzio, um, Chuck Texera, and we were looking at ways of doing it, and we had forks that had a little travel, and, and then uh, we started playing around with just the simple thing of just moving, decoupling the mass and letting the frame, the whole frame become the swing arm, and, uh, and it worked. And so, again, uh, this was driven, it's developed in the road team, but the, the damping side of it and the original concept, we, I kind of wear a hat over in that advanced group, but then also in the suspension team, we were able to do it. But it's pretty cool because Having worked with the Quick Step and and uh, Hands Grow team last year and this year to actually see it in the harshest because those guys, if it didn't, they wouldn't be on it if okay. it didn't work. I mean, they're they're no bullshit kind of guys, and you road, gotta road love guys. Them. Period. Are because I, <laughs> yeah. I laughed the first time I was around a bunch of road guys is right about the time the the disc versus rim argument yep. starts, and yep. those guys are setting their ways. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta basically prove them. You're curing cancer sometimes to get them to switch stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, you know what's funny? I mean, those years that we took all those forks over, you know, Greg Lamond was such a force in Europe in those days, and it was towards the end of his career. But man, he just, he was so well uh, respected over there. So he called and said, "Hey, let's put some on. This will be fun, right?" Because he always would love playing around with that. And once they were on Le Mans bike, I mean, the phone was ringing off the hook for the, the pro peloton teams. But like I say, the commercial side of that never really developed. So we, RockShox kind of just got out of it uh, supporting it. But it's a, it's a fun event and it's fun to be part of the team that's gone back and had success with some sort of system. Um, but the cool thing about our system is if you, the whole integrity, all those years of developing a, an efficient road bike are not interrupted right it's still all of that but guess what we figured out a way to decouple the mass keep the momentum carry going 
It's the last one for you. Yep. Of this is this is gonna be a pretty wide ranging one. Is there to you, is there a single product development, something that stands out mountain biking in the suspension world that you think was the biggest overall improvement for for mountain biking outside of just putting suspension on them, period. Um, whether it's a linkage, a CERN design, a shock, something, a fork, uh, some something with geometry, is there something that stands out to you you think was the single biggest improvement? Uh, you know, I think, well, you, you have to look at the segments, but I think what really started bringing I mean, carbon fiber composite, because, you know, first it was components, then it became frames, and uh, but it's not across the board. But if you look at like XCXC Trail and even the, the all mountain stuff, what we were able as an industry to achieve uh, with the carbon designs is pretty amazing, right? To be able to get the stiffness where we want it, to get the flex uh, where we want it. Um, there, there was a lot of things holding us back um, with the uh, with the aluminum frames. Um, also, I mean, the rims, uh, just all of the components. So we're able to hit some pretty stiff, strong, light bikes again because they're human powered. Um, probably embracing that technology because it wasn't it wasn't a slam dunk. Early on, there was you know the the industry. You know, they, they were making golf shafts, they were making tennis rackets and all this stuff. And we're saying, hey, let's, you know, let's start developing some really interesting things. Now, the fun part of that is when we partnered up with McLaren, obviously they've been doing a lot of composite work in Formula One racing for many, many years. And so when they came in, we were able to learn from them, but they also learned from the team here because of... Uh, again, this was an industry that embraced that technology and probably pushed it and learned and uh, as an industry and has done some pretty cool stuff that, uh, again, in McLaren's case, they were like, wow, that's that's pretty interesting how you guys are doing that and taking it back to, to their labs. So I think that was probably a big breakthrough. Obviously, the suspension components, but as you and I know, because of our affiliation with motocross, there wasn't anything really breaking ground there. I think air spring technology, we had to embrace it, so we got it working pretty good. Um, yeah, I think probably that, I don't know. XC racing, I think the brain technology was, was, you know, it's, it's had its ups and downs over the years, but the, the concept of what it's trying to do is real and has proven itself as well, yeah. so that was yeah. pretty cool. And so many people are trying to do some, you know, whether it's not exactly, in your guys' case, the brain being inertia value, everybody's trying to find a way to, to turn solve. off the suspension yeah. when they yeah. don't want it and turn it back on when they want yeah. it. Yeah, they're trying to, that's exactly it. That was the problem to solve. We did it with the inertia valve in the brain, and I mean, early on, and we're able to keep evolving that to where it's it's a pretty sophisticated one. Because I, I, I'm responsible for obsoleting that technology, right? I'm, I'm not just resting my laurels on that. We're doing all kinds of stuff with electronics and other systems and everything else to to better that. Um, and there there will probably be something, but it wasn't. It's not as easy as it might think to get in there and get something that's as light, as efficient, uh, cost effective. There's all these things that make better product. If we did something that was twenty thousand dollars and only as good through electronics, then I probably didn't do the consumer any good. So, uh, brakes, but it's yeah, all that stuff. Disc brakes, we all know, we know all that stuff. <laughs> did I tell you the first time we put disc brakes on a motocross bike? The guys hated them. Yeah, because yeah. they grab a handful and they about, <laughs> eat, they about go over the bars instead. That's right. They were those poor guys were riding drum brakes, and. Uh, it was easy to put it on the front. If you look back in the, the books, you'll see uh, some of my some of the Kawasaki factory bikes. We had discs on the front and still put drums, drums on, on the, the rear. rear. Uh, and that first disc disc bike, uh, they were they'd go into the turn and stall it, right? Yeah, they just uh, lock it instantly. And they, yeah, and so, but it's all about what they were used to. But uh, t you know, once I think what we had to do is, I think one year we gave them, first year we we let them keep the drum brakes on the rear. And then the second year, because they were going to production with disc disc, I think uh, we wouldn't let them ride the drum brake. And so we did all of our off season testing. And then by the time we were done with the off season testing, we put them back on the drum brake and then they were saying, get that thing out of here. But it was funny how they, uh, yeah, that wasn't a big seller in the beginning. <laughs> they had too much brake. I think that's more brake than we need. <laughs> hey, it happens. It's funny. Um, 
There, it's funny just thinking of like rotor size, everybody doing that. I've tested rear brakes. They're definitely too much. There's <laughs> a certain point where you're like, yeah, I don't need any more rear brake. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. It was a great pleasure. Well, it's always a pleasure. Uh, it's good to see you. And uh, good luck with your series and everything you're doing. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Off Camber Podcast presented by Specialize. I had a really fun time interviewing Mike McAndrews for this piece. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe. I'm trying to put these episodes out every week. We've got a couple interesting things coming up. The next episode is actually with Wes Williams, basically the original guy behind Verb Moto. Um, that one's going to be pretty long at nearly two hours. I'm still trying to decide if we're going to split that episode or not. But Make sure you hit subscribe so you can watch that. If you're listening to this on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, etc., I have a YouTube channel under my name, youtube.com backslash Michael Lindsay. My podcast is hosted there because I actually record them uh, video-wise, so you can find them there as well, along with bike reviews, intros, tech information.